All right, so here in 16.3, we're going to take a look at modes of disease transmission. Uh, so the first term that you should be familiar with is reservoirs. So a reservoir is a living organism or a non-living site where the pathogen normally resides. So wherever it is that a pathogen normally is living and reproducing and metabolizing and all of that is its reservoir. Um, so we can have that in a living organism, so something that normally hangs out and, and lives in a living organism, or it can be a non-living site. So an example for non-living sites would be like the soil, for example. This is where we see endospores for various things like um, uh, West Nile virus or something like that is where we see that is in a non-living site, but that's its reservoir is in the soil. Um, or in the water, for example, in an environment that's conducive to the pathogen existing. So um, we have different um, pathogens that live in the water, so you can get sick if you're in water that's infected with those particular pathogens. That would be their reservoir. Or if it's inside of a particular animal, um, then you come in contact with that animal. Or, like, so, for example, mosquitoes, and then a mosquito bites somebody, then you come in contact with that particular animal. Um, that's their reservoir, something that is going to allow that pathogen to normally reside in that location. Now, there are periods of dormancy or resilience that allow them to survive for varying periods of time. So, for example, Clostridium tetani exists as an endospore in the soil. And this is in the presence of oxygen. So <clears throat> we can have periods of dormancy. So as an endospore, it would be dormant. It's not vegetative. Or resilience, meaning that it is resilient to its environment. So this would be in the example of the endospore. So endospores are resilient. They're in kind of a dormancy state. And they can exist this way. This would be a reservoir, would be the soil for uh, Clostridium tetani. Also, certain types of viruses are able to persist outside of a living cell for varying amounts of time. Um, so keeping in mind that we know that viruses are obligate intracellular organisms. They have to live within an organism. Um, however, they can, you know, persist outside of a living cell for a certain amount of time. So, for example, influenza virus can persist for 48 hours and up to 17 days outside of a living cell. Um, it can't reproduce, make copies of itself, that kind of thing. Not actually technically called reproducing, but it can't make copies of itself. However, it can just hang out there um, for up to 17 days. <clears throat> and then something like rhinoviruses, which is the common cold, typically can't last longer than a day. So there are definitely different um, amounts of time that things like viruses can persist or even other bacteria, like we said, with endospores that can exist outside of a particular host, um, but they can last there longer. All right, so in regards to non-living sites, we have these things, but then we also have living sites. So a first example of a reservoir that is a living reservoir are human reservoirs. So in this case, a human may not be capable of transmitting a pathogen, but it also depends on the stage of infection and the pathogen itself. Um, so it may prefer to be in a human, and so it you know, this particular pathogen prefers to be in humans, hangs out in humans, and so then it gets itself transmitted to other humans so that it can continue living in humans. Um, but there are different stages, of course, as we know. There are different stages and different periods of time or stages of the infection that then can cause transmission. So <clears throat> the CDC then developed guidelines that are based on the risk of transmission, so a way that we can try to stop or prevent things from being transmitted um, as we humans are reservoirs for various types of pathogens. And so these are, again, just guidelines. It doesn't mean that this is um, exactly correct for anybody or everybody. These guidelines are just to help stop spread amongst school children. So, for example, for chicken pox, which is common for school-age children to get, um, chicken pox uses humans as re reservoirs. And the CDC developed this guideline saying, okay, you are contagious for five days after the start of the rash. So uh, among school children, um, parents are told that once a child shows the rash of chicken pox, that they then have to stay home, and they have to stay home five days after the rash starts. And then after those five days, then they can, they're free to come back to school as long as they're uh, feeling well enough to do that. And hopefully at that time, they're no longer contagious. Uh, for example, for GI illnesses, they say to stay home 24 hours after symptoms disappear. 
So in the case of chickenpox, you're saying as soon as kind of the symptoms appear, you have five days and you're good to go. So you may still have, our child may still have some chickenpox there that are healing up, uh, but after five days of the start of the rash, uh, then they can come back and be around people again. Versus a GI illness, so an intestinal issue, uh, they say that once the symptoms disappear, which is usually a diarrhea situation, then the last bout of diarrhea, after that, count 24 hours, and then you're no longer contagious. So within our um, living reservoirs versus our non-living reservoirs, we have what are called carriers. We have different types of carriers. So a carrier is an individual that's capable of transmitting a pathogen, but they don't display symptoms themselves. So they just carry that pathogen. So this would be an example of somebody being asymptomatic. We have two different types of carriers. We have a passive carrier and an active carrier. So a passive carrier is one that is contaminated with the pathogen, but not infected. Um, so in this case, they don't actually have an active infection of anything, but what they can do is they can mechanically transmit it to other people. So this is why it's a passive car uh, carrier. They're not actively infected. So this would be an example of healthcare workers uh, failing to wash their hands after seeing an infectious patient and then passing that mechanically along uh, to another patient or anybody doing that, not just healthcare workers, but um, say a parent, for example, taking care of an ill child, for example, uh, and then they, they don't wash their hands or something or they're helping their child blow their nose and then they turn to go do something else or touch a door handle or something like that, then they could be considered a passive carrier. On the other hand, an active carrier is one that is infected. So this is an infected individual that can then transmit the disease to other people. Um, so they actively have an infection. Now in this case, they may or may not exhibit signs or symptoms. So this is where we have our asymptomatic carriers. So asymptomatic carriers are those that do not exhibit signs or symptoms of a disease, even though they actually have the infection. So sometimes people don't have signs or symptoms, even though they actually have the infection. Let me back up just a moment up to this may or may not exhibit signs or symptoms. If they don't exhibit any signs or symptoms, they may be an asymptomatic carrier. But if they do show signs or symptoms, in this case, what we might be talking about is not only a person that has signs or symptoms, being able to, to carry that and transmit it to somebody else, but it could also be a person that currently isn't showing signs or symptoms. So meaning that it is at the beginning of the stages of infection, and so this person doesn't quite know even at this point that they have some sort of infection. Maybe they just feel tired and they assume it's the stress or the lack of sleep or whatever the case is, but they're actually infected and then they're able to transmit that to others. If it's a particular illness that or a particular pathogen that can be infectious or contagious at that point, um, or perhaps after the person has healed or what they feel is healed, they can still be contagious at that point. So they may not have signs or symptoms at that moment, and they can still be an active carrier, or they have signs and symptoms, or they may have never had signs or symptoms, and that would be an asymptomatic carrier. So some examples of asymptomatic carriers would be somebody that has the hepatitis B virus. So oftentimes a person doesn't have any signs or symptoms of having hepatitis B, but they can then um, be a carrier for that, and in fact other people are transmitted to other people. Same thing with the herpes simplex virus. So one example of the herpes simplex virus is, the, is one of the herpes simplex viruses that cause cold sores, for example. Um, so a person may not have an active sign or symptom, meaning they may not have an active cold sore or a cold sore at that moment, but they could still be passing that along to another person. Same thing with HIV. Maybe at the time they don't um, know that they're infected with HIV, but they can pass that along to somebody else. Um, or <clears throat> they know that they're infected. Um, and then they can pass it along to somebody else. Another example um, is HPV, the human papilloma virus. So it's estimated that 80 or more percent of the population, the entire population of the world, has human papilloma virus, has some sort of infection with human papilloma virus. Now, there are different strains of the human papilloma virus, but they're saying 80% or higher. That was the last thing I heard about 10 years ago, um, was 80% or more actually has HPV. Now that does not mean that 80% of the, of the population of the world is showing signs or symptoms. So this is often an asymptomatic virus. <clears throat> so people don't show symptoms and then they can pass it along, which is why so much of the population has HPV, um, because people don't have any idea that they're passing it along. So when we're speaking about reservoirs, it doesn't have to be one single reservoir. So there can be more than one reservoir for a particular pathogen. 
Um, we also see this with zoonotic diseases. Remember, a zoonotic disease is one that can go from animals and move into humans. So an animal can be infected with something and can pass it along to humans. So other animals may be the reservoir, but then humans can also be the reservoir. They can both act as reservoirs. Um, and oftentimes this animal... Um, can be affected by it. So sometimes it does affect the other animal. So the other animal does seem sick in some way. Um, and then perhaps if it is livestock, for example, um, and the animal seems sick, then the human is, is trying to, you know, take this animal and, and take care of this animal. And then it gets passed along to the human. And then that human can pass along to other humans. Um, but sometimes they're asymptomatic. So sometimes the animal themselves, they're a carrier <clears throat> and they're a reservoir for this particular pathogen, but it does absolutely nothing in their body. It doesn't affect them in any way whatsoever. They don't look ill. They don't feel ill. Nothing's different. Um, it's just something that they have in their body that's just living happily in their body. But then when they pass along to humans, then it actually causes an active infection and illness with signs and symptoms. <clears throat> in the case of parasitic infections, a parasite's preferred host is called a definitive host. Um, so the definitive host is the one that is preferred <clears throat> and those that have complex life cycles, when we say that the definitive host, or what when we mention the definitive host in one that has a complex life cycle, the definitive host is the one where it reaches sexual maturity, the actual pathogen itself. So it can have other intermediate hosts. This is where the parasite can go through other immature life cycle stages. Um, so it can be moving um, through various intermediate hosts, but the one where it actually reaches sexual maturity, that is then called the definitive host. Um, so there are different types of pathogens that are going to have a preferred host, and that preferred host is the one that it's actually going to reach sexual maturity in, and then that, of course, is called the definitive host. So now that we've talked about the different reservoirs and different carriers, now let's move into the transmission of that pathogen. So transmission must occur for the infection to spread, right? We know that, that if it's within one person, then there's the infection in the person, but it has to move on. It has to, it has to be transmitted to another location in order for that to spread. Um, so it has to move from the reservoir to the individual. So meaning if the reservoir is the soil, in order for it to spread, it must get into an animal. Um, or it can be you know, transferred or moved, uh, transmitted from person to person or animal to person. So once it moves from the reservoir, um, whether that reservoir is a non-living location or another living location, then it transfers to, or it transmits to the individual. Uh, then the individual can transmit the infectious, infectious agent to other susceptible individuals. So we know that this is transmission, moving from one location to the next to the next. And this can be done either directly or indirectly. So the first one we'll talk about is contact transmission. And so we can have contact transmission directly or indirectly. So we have direct contact transmission or indirect contact transmission. So direct contact transmission is when the agent is transmitted by physical contact between two individuals. So as its name implies, directly contacting another person. So for example, when you touch another person, so you know someone coughs on their hand and then they shake hands, that's direct contact, moving from one person to the other person. Um, kissing between two individuals. If one person has an infection, they can pass it along or transmit that to another. That's direct contact. Also through sexual intercourse or droplet sprays. <clears throat> so in this case, um, direct contact still includes, like if you are with one person and, you know, and sitting next to the other person, you turn to them and you talk to them, um, and then you have droplet sprays. So as you're speaking, for example, uh, if you're coughing, um, that can be transmitted to the other person. That would be considered direct contact. So then when we talk about direct contact, we have vertical direct contact transmission. We also have horizontal direct contact transmission and droplet transmission. So vertical direct contact transmission is when the pathogens are transmitted from the mother to the child during pregnancy, birth, or breastfeeding. So vertical, meaning up and down, right? So going from the mother, and then it's being passed on down the chain to the child. So that's vertical direct transmission. So a direct, because it's touching from one person to the other. So the mother to child during pregnancy, right? So as the child is growing inside of the mother, 
Um, that would be a direct contact situation where the mother gets infected with something. They pass it along direct to the other individual, so the growing baby. Um, that's direct transmission. Or through birth, um, so moving through the birth canal if something is passed along. Or through breastfeeding. So if the mother is infected with something that gets into breast milk and then that's transmitted to the child, that is another example of direct contact transmission. And it's vertical, so going from one generation to the next generation. Then we have horizontal direct contact transmission. So <clears throat> this is generally contact between mucous membranes. Um, so when we have contact between mucous membranes and we're moving it from one person to another person. So for example, skin-to-skin -skin contact can lead to mucous membrane contact. So if the new host then touches their mucous membrane. So for example, Skin-to-skin um, -skin contact, meaning, again, if one person coughs, you know, covers their cough with their hand and then goes to shake the hand of another person, if the other person that they shook their hand with then goes to rub their eye, that would be putting a pathogen, for example, um, right into their eye, a mucous membrane. Or if they then are eating uh, and they touch their fingers to their mouth uh, or the inside of their mouth, um, then that would be another direct contact. Um, leading or starting from skin to skin, but eventually it's touching the mucous membrane. This may also be site specific. Uh, so some are transmitted only via sexual contact, for example. Um, so if one person has a particular pathogen, so say like gonorrhea, for example, then it would require something like sexual contact because it is site specific. So of course, shaking the hand of or um, being near somebody that coughs that has gonorrhea is not going to transmit that pathogen to the next person. So then the next one is droplet transmission. So again, if an infected individual coughs or sneezes, then these small droplets containing the pathogen are ejected from that individual and then move on to the next individual. Um, so transmission of a pathogen to a new host over distances of one meter or less. So if it's within that one meter, that's why I mentioned earlier, if the person is sitting next to you and then the person coughs or uh, sneezes or something, that would be less than one meter. If it's over one meter, then it's considered airborne transmission. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So droplet transmission is literally the actual droplets are able to fall on the person because they're so close to you um, versus airborne transmission, which we'll see in a moment, is where they can hang out in the air for a little bit longer and that's over one meter away. And that leads us into our indirect contact transmission. <clears throat> so indirect contact transmission, as is the name implies, not direct contact, right? So it's indirect. So rather than that being, you know, skin-to-skin -skin contact or mucous membrane to mucous membrane or even a close droplet contact or mother-to-child contact, now what we're talking about is something that's indirect. So this would be an inanimate object. Um, so remember, fomites. So this is when we would be using fomites to pass along the pathogen or to transmit the pathogen. So this is where the infected person would then touch or interact with a fomite, an inanimate object, and then that becomes contaminated by the pathogen, and then it's going to move on from there. So it can be contaminated by an infected individual or the reservoir. So uh, let me say that as well. So for example, if somebody has something that is in the soil and the endospores get on the soil that would be moving from the reservoir to an inanimate object, um, let's say a toy, right? So a toy is in the dirt somewhere. They are, you know, a kid comes out, finds a toy that's buried in the dirt, has endospores on it, and then the kid, you know, brings a toy in and is playing, in the to playing with the toy. Uh, that would be a fomite and that would be indirect contact. Uh, so in this case, <clears throat> for indirect contact transmission, a person with a cold may sneeze, causing droplets to land on a fomite, uh, so for example, a tablecloth, or wipe their nose on their hand and then transfer it to a doorknob, or cough into their hand, transfer it to a doorknob. So again, this is anything being passed to something that is an inanimate object. And then the other person, the new susceptible host, touches that fomite and then transfers it to a portal of entry. Um, so if that particular uh, pathogen doesn't go in through the skin, then for example, as I mentioned previously, they end up, you know, rubbing their eye after touching the door handle or um, <clears throat> coughing themselves and touching their mouth when they cough and they've now um, put this new pathogen in their body.
So fomites also include things in healthcare settings that have not been properly sterilized. So we have the image here of one of the needles, for example, uh, because again, they are inanimate objects and they can, they can be used to transmit pathogens. <clears throat> Another type of transmission is vehicle transmission. This is another type of indirect contact. So through vehicle transmission, this is when we have our transmission of pathogens through vehicles, such as water, food, and air. So this is not fomites, right? So fomites are actually inanimate objects. Now we're talking about some other type of vehicle, something that can move it from one location to another, meaning water, food, or air. Uh, so we see this oftentimes with poor sanitation methods. Um, so if we have water that's contaminated, we can move that pathogen to the new host. Um, also, waterborne transmission. So again, when we see pathogens in water, um, that may be the reservoir, or maybe the reservoir is in the sandy ba banks of a lake or a river or something. Uh, and then that water can be used as a vehicle, and then that vehicle, you know, then a human, for example, is playing in the water, swimming in the water, and then they become infected uh, because that water was used as a vehicle. So this is something that we saw with the Broad Street um, study with John Snow as well, the um, pump issue. Um, so we saw that there's water contamination, and then that was utilized, or that was a vehicle, right? So the um, bacteria was multiplying in the water. You know, likely it came from the fecal matter that was dumped, the sewage um, in the river. And then that was moved to the pump where they were pumping out water. And then that water was brought to the various homes and then people were getting cholera. Uh, so water contamination. And the WHO, the, water, or the World Health Organization, estimates that 500,000 deaths each year are due to contaminated drinking water. So oftentimes this is happening in other places, not in this country so much, but sometimes does happen in this country uh, or other first world countries. <clears throat> also poor or uh, food contamination. <clears throat> so we have foodborne transmission. So we are oftentimes familiar with that. Um, so if somebody thaws something out incorrectly, um, so remembering our thawing techniques. So if somebody sets something out on the counter, you know, leaves for work in the morning, sets something out on the counter to thaw, and then comes back later, um, that is a perfect opportunity for bacteria to just start growing on the outside part that has thawed already and is already warm, just sitting on the counter um, versus the inside that might still be frozen. So not thawing something correctly, or <clears throat> when we're talking about um, restaurants, for example, we have the fecal-oral route, um, which could be, you know, contaminating the food, and then a person gets sick via that uh, method. So that's a foodborne transmission, um, or letting things sit out too long. So another example we've already mentioned is the potato salad, for example. If there's dairy in there, dairy oftentimes is contaminated with bacteria, um, the bacteria sitting out too long at a picnic, for example, in the nice warm sun can then cause an illness in people. Then we also have airborne. Um, so <clears throat> it's transmitted through the air. This can be through aerosols, so dust and fine particles. They can float in the air and they can sometimes carry pathogens. So any dust or little fine particles in the air can carry those pathogens long distances and this can facilitate transmission. So, for example, the hantavirus, uh, this is found in mouse feces in their urine and saliva. So any kind of thing that comes out of a mouse, they can have the hantavirus, and then that's um, through their urine and saliva and feces that gets outside of the mouse. And then when it dries up, so whether or not we're talking about urine or saliva or feces, that dries up, and then it turns into small particles, so fine particles. Those fine particles then can become airborne when they're disturbed, and then it can cause some serious respiratory illnesses. So sometimes we see this, that hantavirus is a problem in old barns, for example, um, or properties that have really old <clears throat> extra um, buildings on them, uh, additional buildings. Because the mouse that has the hantavirus, you know, may be living in there for quite some time, and then, you know, maybe the mouse dies or moves on or something, and then the feces is left behind. The feces is left behind, it dries out over time, gets, you know, decomposes into some dust there, disintegrates, and then when a person goes in, 
says, okay, now it's time to clean out this old barn or whatever it is, um, they can then kick that up. You know, they start sweeping to clean up the area. They don't see the mouse feces because at this point they're just kind of dust all over the floor because they've disintegrated, and then they can actually breathe in the hantavirus, and that can lead to serious respiratory illnesses. Also, our fine mucus droplets. So again, in this case, um, remember we talked about droplets already. When we talked about droplets, though, it was within a meter. Um, that was direct contact transmission through droplets. In this case, we're talking about those same droplets, but they're traveling long distances, so greater than a meter. Uh, and then they can desiccate to form a droplet nucleus that can transmit the pathogen. <clears throat> so it's going to kind of lose some of its other stuff that is in that initial cough, and then it can transmit the pathogen with kind of what's left behind. Different things are going to uh, adjust this or, or make it so that a person can in, get infected from further away or, you know, less far away. And those things include things like air temperature and humidity. Um, so those need to be taken into consideration in regards to how long something can be floating in the air. Um, but they can travel long distances just through the air. So another example of indirect contact is through vectors, so vector transmission. There are two different types of vectors that we'll talk about, and those are a mechanical vector and biological vector. So a mechanical vector <coughs> is going to have mechanical transmission. So when we talk about mechanical, this is when the animal is going to carry a pathogen but is not infected, uh, similar to what we spoke about when we talked about carriers. Um, typically, when we're talking about carriers, though, we're talking about other animals um, like humans <clears throat> being carriers for a particular pathogen. When we're talking about vectors, we're talking about things like insects. Um, so, for example, a fly landing on infected feces then lands on the human food and then infects the humans. So you can see this is the image here. The fly lands on some feces here. It picks up the pathogen. Now, when we say picks up the pathogen, we don't mean that it gets it in its body and it has an infection. We're saying that literally it's just on its feet. So then it's going to fly over and land on some food that we are going to eat, and then the person eats the contaminated food and then gets sick. So this is an example of a of mechanical transmission, where it's actually picking up the pathogen and bringing it somewhere else. And um, this isn't on purpose oftentimes, but it does it just by doing what it often does anyway. Um, so whatever animal it is, it's just doing what it does, going about its business. It doesn't get infected. It just happens to carry it along with it. So then biological transmission, as you may have guessed, is when the pathogen actually reproduces within that biological vector. Uh, so our bi biological vector is when it actually is infected with that particular organism. And then what it does is it transmits it from one host to another. So, for example, we have our infected mosquito is then going to bite an uninfected person. <clears throat> so our infected person gets bit by the mosquito. Then that mosquito bites an uninfected person. That infection then spreads throughout the body, including in the red blood cells. Then we can transmit that by having a different mosquito come along and then bite this infected person, grab some of its blood, and then it can move on to transmit it to the next person, if this is the next person here. So this is an example of a biological transmission because the actual insect, in this case the mosquito, is bringing the pathogen inside of its body. Um, since it's bringing it inside of its body rather than it just being stuck on the outside of the insect, it's called a biological vector. So our arthropods are our main biological vectors. They typically bite the host, uh, then create a wound that acts as a portal of entry. So, for example, the mosquito. Uh, we see mosquitoes are transmitting malaria, lots of other things, uh, Zika, dengue. <clears throat> Lice um, can transmit typhus. Ticks uh, can transmit Lyme disease. Mites um, can transmit scrub typhus and rickettsial pox. So all of these are just diff different examples of arthropod vectors. Um, so arthropods that are going to bite or grab onto one animal and then bring it into itself and then transmit it to another. <clears throat> 
But we do have some non-arthropod vectors. So sometimes we have mammals, for example, rabies. So the dog has rabies inside of its body. It's infected with it. So then when it bites another person or bites a person, uh, then they would transmit rabies to that person via the bite. Uh, birds, for example, the avian influenza. <clears throat> so this was via direct contact or indirect contact uh, with their feces, saliva, or mucus. Uh, but in that case, it was a non-arthropod vector. Uh, so the bird <clears throat> would get this avian influenza and then fly over to somebody else and then indirectly um, or through direct contact, like actually uh, interacting with the human or indirect with feces, saliva, and mucus can transmit this then. So here are some examples of arthropod vectors. Um, you don't need to memorize this table in any way. I just suggest that you take a look at it. Um, <clears throat> some of these you should already be familiar with. Um, some of these we've already taken a close look at. So Yersinia pestis, Trypanosoma cruciae. Um, so you should be familiar with something like the kissing bug or that uh, Yersinia pestis is transmitted via the flea. Um, we know a lot of the mosquito ones, so yellow fever, <clears throat> uh, Plasmodium falciparum, which is going to give malaria, West Nile virus, giving West Nile disease, uh, the tsetse fly with uh, Trypanosoma brucei. So this is giving us that um, sleeping sickness. Through a tick, we get rickettsia, rickettsii, so Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Also through a tick, Borrelia species, which uh, provide Lyme disease or cause Lyme disease. Leishmaniasis is caused by a sand fly. Um, up here, another Rickettsium, a Rickettsial pox. Rickettsial pox uh, is through a mite or scrub typhus we just mentioned. <clears throat> through a louse, we can get uh, Rickettsia prowazekii, which uh, provides typhus or causes typhus. And then we also have some uh, Borrelia recurrentis and Bartonella quintana. And then up here at the top, we have our black fly, uh, which can give river blindness or cause river blindness, something we haven't really spoken about in this class. Um, so just kind of going over these so you can get the idea that there are lots of arthropod vectors. And lots of them we've already have covered in this um, class because we've already covered a lot of these different pathogens and these diseases. So with all of this transmission happening, whether indirect or direct, uh, we do things like quarantining then. So let's take a look at quarantining. Uh, so in an attempt to stop this transmission moving from one person to another, particularly um, with particularly difficult illnesses, we quarantine people. So this is when we isolate an individual to prevent transmission of disease to others. So there are special wards in hospitals and other healthcare facilities for these particularly hazardous diseases. So things like TB or B Ebola, for example, people will be isolated uh, and moved away from the rest of the population just so that they do not transmit this to other people um, in an hopeful uh, or hoping that they don't transmit it to other people. It doesn't always work, but uh, of course we try our best to not continue transmission. Uh, they may be equipped with special air handling methods. So if it's something like Ebola, people take that very, very serious. It's very dangerous. Um, so these quarantine areas and, and special wards and hospitals can have different air handling methods. Uh, they also have different protocols, so special protocols so that they can limit the risk of transmission. Um, so we have different PPE here, so personal protective equipment. Um, in this case, this would be an example of kind of some of these BSLs that we've talked about previously, um, where people will use different chemical disinfectant sprays um, before they go into the room, like a nurse or a physician or something before they go into the room and deal with or interact with uh, the patient that is quarantined. And same thing upon exiting. Um, so they would go through a series of, of steps to make sure that they leave and they're not taking it with them. They're not transmitting that outside of the quarantine unit. So when we're talking about how long a person would be quarantined for, this is the duration of time. And this really depends on the incubation period for that particular pathogen. Um, it also depends on the evidence that's suggestive of the infection. So what they would be looking at are all of those stages of infection that we spoke about, but they would be specific to the particular pathogen. So if somebody is quarantined, oftentimes um, it's a pretty serious illness. 
And if it's a pretty serious illness, then they typically will know what pathogen it is that they are working with. And so they might know already the stages of infection. They also might know um, when it can be transmitted, when it's no longer something that can be transmitted. And so then oftentimes a person may leave if they no longer have any signs or any symptoms of the disease. Um, so this is tracked, of course. They, they would, of course, make sure that there's plenty of time passed for, since the last sign or symptom. <clears throat> So when there is a confirmed infection, um, so when they absolutely know that they're infected with something, they re may remain until they're no longer considered contagious. So again, they're going to look at those signs, they're going to look at those symptoms, they know what pathogen they're working with, so it's a confirmed infection. So then they're going to take a close look at that and make sure that the person remains in quarantine until they're no longer contagious. So in the U.S., we've seen patients that are quarantined with things like cholera, diphtheria, infectious TB, uh, different strains of influenza uh, that are capable of causing a pandemic. Um, so something that's very serious. These, this is when we are going to quarantine someone. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. However, those people that are traveling overseas may be quarantined when they return, if they could have been exposed to one of these things. So uh, for example, the Zika virus, that was a, a serious concern relatively recently. So people that were coming back from areas that had Zika virus um, oftentimes were quarantined for a period of time just to watch and make sure that they did not have it so that they did not bring it further into the United States. So now we're going to shift just a little bit here and talk about some nosocomial infections. So in the nosocomial infections, this is when we're talking about a healthcare-associated infection or an HAI. So a healthcare-associated infection or a nosocomial infection. These are infections that are acquired in healthcare facilities. <clears throat> That's why they're healthcare-associated, uh, also called nosocomial. So oftentimes these are connected with surgery or other invasive procedures because this is a person that acquired this infection because of some procedure that they were doing or having done. <clears throat> it is classified as an HAI or nosocomial infection when the person is admitted to the healthcare facility for a reason other than the infection. So this would be, um, say somebody has is going in and getting appendectomy, so they're getting their appendix taken out. Um, they're going in, they're not sick per se, right? They don't have an actual infection with a pathogen. They have another problem, but if they come out of the hospital with another infection, that would be a nosocomial infection. Uh, so say they go in for something, for some other surgery completely unrelated to pathogens, and then when they leave, they get a, a pathogen or they have a pathogen, then this would be a nosocomial infection. <clears throat> or they had a primary disease. Uh, oftentimes this happens, somebody goes in, they have a primary disease, um, some other reason they're being seen. But then in this case, they're more susceptible to a secondary infection <clears throat> and opportunistic pathogens. And we already spoke about this, where a person has a, a primary disease, say they go into the hospital, they go into uh, their physician, they're waiting in the waiting room. Um, when they're doing that, they're going in for one particular pathogen, for example. But when they leave, they have been uh, infected with another pathogen. And this is because they're more susceptible, because their body's already trying to fight off one pathogen. It makes it very susceptible to an additional pathogen um, or to opportunistic pathogens, those pathogens that are already looking for the opportunity when somebody's immune system is being overworked or is compromised. <clears throat> there are more than 720,000 nosocomial diseases in hospitals in the U.S. Uh, during 2011 is the data the most recent data from the CDC. <clears throat> so 22% are coming from a surgical site, 13% coming from a urinary tract infection, and 10% from the bloodstream. Uh, so that leaves a lot of other things there, but we have some statistics here from the CDC um, saying that, as you can see out of these three in particular, that at the surgical site is of serious concern. Uh, so making sure that patients do not get a secondary infection um, or a primary infection um, at the surgical site. <clears throat> this can happen because of contaminated surgical equipment uh, or medical equipment. Uh, we did talk about biofilms. Remember that biofilms are very, very difficult to get off of surfaces, and this includes some surgical equipment or medical equipment. So even though they can be sterilized, remember biofilms are um, 
very, very uh, well equipped to last through any sort of process to try to get rid of them. Uh, so it might, might still be hanging on and then another person is going to get that infection. Ways to stop this or, way, or ways to stop this is through training, for example, making sure that people are doing things that are appropriate, making sure that we're not transmitting those pathogens, uh, as well as hygiene protocols. So um, one of the more preventable ways to get or to stop nosocomial infections, I guess I didn't say that right, but um, one of the ways to make sure that nosocomial infections decrease is by washing hands. <clears throat> so it's very important that those hygiene protocols are checked up on and are continuously talked about within those um, medical facilities or clinics so that people aren't passing them along, aren't transmitting them. All right, so here we are going to switch into 16.4. So 16.4, we're going to talk about kind of global public health, um, so things in general. So some examples of global public health entities, one is the World Health Organization, or the WHO. Um, so the WHO is an agency of the United Nations. <clears throat> so our U.S. contribution is called the CDC. So we already spoke about the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, which is the CDC. The CDC is then going to contribute to the World Health Organization uh, because the World Health Organization is part of our, as its name implies, world health. Um, so it's our global public health. <clears throat> What they do is coordinate on international public health issues. So when we're talking about pandemics, so our United States CDC will go to the WHO, and then all of the other agencies from the other countries would all come together, and they are going to be discussing different things. Um, so they're able to coordinate on these public health issues that are international. They also monitor and report on infectious diseases. So again, we have these publications each week that are coming out from the CDC that is also going to the WHO, and the WHO is this um, you know, organization that has all of these other nations that are represented, and they're presenting their information, we're presenting their information, and then all of that is going to be compiled into information from the WHO and give us our global numbers. So they develop and implement strategies for control and preve prevention of infectious diseases. So again, our CDC is doing its part. The other countries have their own version of the CDC that are doing their part, and then they all come together for the good of the world as a whole. An example of this is the smallpox vaccination program. Uh, this actually resulted in uh, pretty much global eradication of the disease by 1980. Uh, so they started the smallpox vaccination program in the 1960s. Um, everybody in the WHO agreed that they wanted to do this, so they brought out the smallpox vaccination to as many countries as possible. They started vaccinating people for smallpox, and then by 1980, we pretty much didn't see that pathogen anymore. We didn't see that disease anymore. <clears throat> we currently, uh, the WHO, have programs targeting malaria, that's a huge problem, um, HIV and AIDS, and they have been for a long time, and tuberculosis. Uh, those are three of the main ones that the WHO is actively looking at, um, actively working on programs to try to eradicate, <clears throat> just like the smallpox was. Uh, there are programs also to reduce illness and mortality due to violence, due to accidents, due to lifestyle-associated illnesses, so things like diabetes, smoking, etc. Because when we're talking about the WHO, this is the World Health Organization. It's not just related to infectious diseases. Um, so we are kind of taking the approach of infectious diseases, but this is just as a general health issues. Um, so illness and mortality due to violence, due to accidents, lifestyle-associated illnesses. Um, so it includes all of these things. They do have a global alert and response system. Uh, so this is logical support uh, and coordination of response to emergency. So this again is if we had some sort of outbreak here, an epidemic that is of serious concern um, as for global health, our CDC would report that to the WHO, and then the WHO would have this global alert and response system. So it would send this information out to all the other organizations as a part of the World Health Organization, 
and then they can coordinate the response to that. So when we talk about our global public health, we have different things like emerging infectious diseases. Um, so these are some of the things that the WHO are, they're going to discuss and coordinate about and develop um, processes or procedures or programs to try to get rid of or, or try to even contain. <clears throat> So they're going to be taking a look at things like emerging infectious, infectious diseases. Uh, so these are infectious diseases that are new to the human population. So that's why they're emerging. They're just coming up. They're emerging. They also take a look at re-emerging infectious diseases. So these are infectious diseases that have shown to increase in prevalence in the previous 20 years. So not only is the WHO focused on taking a look at new infectious diseases um, and developing programs, et cetera, regarding those. They also keep track of data, of course, as the CDC is going to present it to them and other organizations. They're going to keep track of data over many years, and as they're keeping track of this, they can then see something that's re-emerging, so re-emerging infectious disease. Uh, so sometimes this is because the conditions have changed, and then this causes an increase in the frequency. Um, so if we have differences or changes in the weather, for example, so say we have something that's different over the last 20 years, and then some condition has changed, then this may cause a re-emergence of an infectious disease. So both show a need to apply resources to understand and control its growing impact. So... <clears throat> When we're talking about emerging diseases or re-emerging diseases, um, this requires resources to understand them and then also to control it. Um, so the who is going to be on top of doing just that, taking a look at what's happening. Um, and of course, this all builds on itself, right? So we already spoke about how the different clinicians and physicians are reporting these numbers back to their you know, local health department, so whoever's in the, the county health department, then the county health department is going to submit these numbers to the state health department, then the state health department is going to submit them to the CDC, then the CDC is going to submit them to the WHO, and then this is happening in other countries. So we're getting that information from the ground level all the way up. So for example, uh, Ebola was of major concern, so a, a global public health crisis. It had been seen before in small, isolated, and contained populations, but in 2014, 2015, there was a large outbreak in Western Africa, um, and that had never been seen before. So this was a re-emerging disease. We had seen Ebola before, really small areas, isolated, contained, not a problem. But in 2014, 2015, there's this big outbreak in Africa. So some of the issues with the Ebola is that there's a high transmission rate, uh, so it transmits very, very easily, um, very easy to move from one person to the other. The cultural practices for treatment of the dead were an issue, so the way that they were treating their dead, <clears throat> so as people are dying of Ebola, then the way that they're treating their dead is going to cause other people to get Ebola. So handling the dead um, in, with inappropriate means, you know, meaning that they're, they're not disinfecting things, they're not disinfecting themselves. Um, so then that was spreading the Ebola to the families as well. And then emergence in an urban setting. So one of the issues, one of the reasons why it was a large outbreak is because we saw it even in urban settings in Western Africa. So therefore, it spread rapidly, and then it required a large emergency effort um, because it was spreading so rapidly and it's so dangerous. <clears throat> so first, we try to manage an epidemic in one location, uh, whether it's developing or a, a already developed country. And then due to global transportation, it can spread quickly throughout the world. So they try to manage it. They try to keep it in one location. So they try to manage the epidemic. Remember, the epidemic is uh, more local. And then whether or not it's a developing or an already developed country. But then because we have global transportation, people flying from one country to the other country, perhaps before they have signs or symptoms, then it can be spread easily and quickly throughout the world. So you can see here in the illustration to the right of the table here, 
that we have cases of Ebola virus here. Uh, this is Ebola virus worldwide, and then the years down here. So you can see that back in 1976 to 1979, there were some cases of Ebola. Um, but then, you know, we saw a couple little blips here in the 1980s to 90s, and then we see this big rise. So a little bit here, but then a large number of people here in 2014, 2015. So then when we talk about our re-emerging infectious diseases, we actually see these after there was some sort of period of decline. So uh, a re again, a re-emerging infectious disease is an infectious disease that is increasing in frequency after previous periods of decline. Uh, so this, again, may be a result of changing conditions. It could mean that people are, um, whatever they were to doing to prevent this, are no longer working. So not only could they change the conditions, maybe they're no longer doing whatever it was that they were doing to prevent the illness, or whatever it was that they were doing to prevent the illness perhaps is not working any longer. So for example, <clears throat> the drug-resistant forms of TB. Um, so because of what we were doing before, giving particular drugs um, for TB. Now that's no longer working because of drug resistance, uh, so we need to do something different. Same thing with bacterial pneumonia and malaria. So we have issues with either the changing conditions, so the pathogen itself changing, which we've already spoken about, um, or things like um, antibiotic resistance, for example. So uh, we're also seeing drug-resistant strains of bacteria that cause things like gonorrhea and syphilis now. Uh, so that wasn't typically the case a long time ago. So we're seeing re-emergence of these things, of gonorrhea and syphilis, because things that we were do doing before, the old uh, ways of preventing are no longer working. So we're getting things like drug-resistant strains of bacteria that cause gonorrhea and syphilis. And then, of course, this makes it easier for those organisms to be transmitted and to live on.